Hello, welcome to Breaking It All Down. I'm Count Zero. Well, last night I went and I saw Prometheus. I don't have video clips of this or anything, so this is going to be a talking head review. Sorry. Um, so, this will be my review. I'm going to start spoiler free, and then after I get give my spoiler free thoughts, I will give a warning, and then go into the spoiler version of the review. I'll give you plenty of advance notice on that. I'll give you enough information to decide whether or not to see you want to see the film or not before then, and I will give my um, recommendation before I go spoilery. So, I was disappointed by this film. I'm a fan of the Alien series of the first three films. Four was terrible, but everyone agrees four was terrible, so, yeah. Um... It's, it's not as bad as Alien Resurrection, which, again, it tried to actively take a dump on the entire Alien franchise as a whole. Um, last weekend, in fact, I went and I watched all four Alien movies with a bunch of friends. We all agreed Alien Resurrection was actively trying to troll the fans. Um, however, this film is... I mean, it's got a lot of... Ahead of it, it's, it's got a lot to try and do. It has to be a prequel to one of the greatest science fiction and horror films in the history of cinema, and it fails. It fails kind of badly. Um, so I'll get all the positive stuff out of the way first before I get into the negative aspect of things. The acting performances in this film are good. The characters are not well written, but the performances put in by a lot of these actors are good. Idris Elba plays the ship's captain. Numi Rapace, whose last name I mangled, she's from the Girl with the Dragon Tattoo series. She plays the main character, Dr. Elizabeth Shaw. And Charlize Theron all do very, very good jobs in this film. Guy Pierce does okay as Doc. does a good job as Dr. Wayland. Um, and Michael Fassbender does an amazing job as the android. David. It's not a spoiler that he's an android. They make it clear fairly, fairly early on he's an android. Um, also, set design is excellent in this. I mean, the set designs in the original Alien were good. These were almost better. Almost better. Um, I, say, I say almost because Alien sold that you were on a big industrial ship. Whereas um, this it doesn't quite make it clear that this is a proper science vessel. We don't see how really well equipped it is. It's got a crew of 17 going to investigate this star system. Um, the premise is, is um, Dr. Shaw and her... I'm not sure if, she, if he's her boyfriend or her husband. Um, an archaeologist in all these various dig sites across the world of all these different civilizations which never could have had contact with each other. They find this common s pictograph and symbol of a humanoid being pointing at what appears to be a star system. All... I mean, like Sumerians, Egyptians... Um, a island off the coast of Scotland. Um, I mean, it, it's a clear that these are places where they could not be communicating with each other and share this share this common symbol. Um, so they decide, and this is where things start falling apart. That clearly this means that humanity was created by a progenitor race, and they are at this system waiting for us to come and say hello. Not, oh, we were contacted previously by an alien progenitor race, a la Stargate. But no, we were seeded somehow. And to be fair, we do see the seeding happen at the very beginning of the movie. Like, this is before the title card. Um, and so, we, we see the seeding happen, so apparently they're accurate. But... They're not totally 100% accurate, and... Still, even then, there isn't enough evidence to back up their claims that we were seated. It just if they were to claim that there was contacted, 
it would make sense. We were contacted. It would make sense. And anyway, so this leads to the expedition of the science official Prometheus, sponsored by the Wayland Corporation, which does terraforming. Um, basically, they're going out to go meet God. They are not bringing any sort of um, diplomats on this mission, or just just a science vessel, science expedition. Okay. But anyway, I don't want to get too far into spoilers or anything like that yet. Um, we're talking about the actors. The actor performances are good. David, the character, the android, played by Michael Fassbender, best character here. Um, he does a good job seeing off as basically a character who doesn't... It isn't totally human, or isn't human at all, both in terms of, like biologically designed and in terms of excuse me in terms of thinking that's well done I, I'd say but this if they were going to do a star if they were to do a Star Trek the next generation reboot film now um, like they did with classic like they did with the original Trek Michael Fassbender would be a good pick for data except David in this is a darker data he is not like lore in terms of where he has emotions and is a embrace them to go psychotic. This is a character who is who is a sociopath. Without without getting into any real spoiler things here, he's a character who I mean this this is getting to stuff where it's in the peripheral things like the TED Talk and the Meet David video um, that were done to the hype this. So it's not really a spoiler. David is kind of a character who is a sociopath. He's not like a um, he's not depicted in the beginning as a villainous sociopath. I mean, he still has motivations. He still has some sort of emotional things. Um, there's this neat little bit. There's some bits with David and watching Lawrence of Arabia, which are kind of interesting. Um, anyway, I'm trying to stay out of the spoilers here. Um, but yeah, this the problem though. The characters are one-dimensional. The majority of the crew of Prometheus, I don't remember the names of. Their names didn't stick with me. Even characters whose actors whose performances did good job, like Idris Elba's, I still don't remember the name of the captain of the Prometheus. I mean, it helps that I, mean, I, re I remember the name of all the all of the crew of the Nostromo, but that's also because I've seen it a bunch of times. But even then, they said the names a lot, and it was a small cast so that everyone's talking to each other and we're seeing them enough times that everyone's fleshed out. Where the Nostromo had a crew of six I think six Ripley Lambert Dallas Ash Parker and Brett yeah, six the um, Prometheus is a crew of 17 we don't get everybody's names and we don't spend a lot of time with all of them enough time for all of them to get to know them before things go to crap. I mean, and we know they're going to go to crap. If you've seen the trailer, you know things are going to crap. Hell, if you knew that this was a prequel to Alien, logically, things would have to go to crap. Um, the problem with... I mean, the problem with the Yes, the characters are very well developed, except for David, who is... But they develop him too well. As I mentioned, he's clear he's kind of a sociopath. He has emotions, but he doesn't know how they work. He doesn't know why he was given them. Um, he is generally treated as being less than human because he's not human by the other crew members. And it leads to a situation where we expect him to go bad, which means when he goes bad, we're getting we're, we're not surprised, we're not shocked, we're not disappointed. You expect the fall to happen. There's no point where we go. Oh, well, he'll turn good. He'll turn good after all. It'll be okay. No, no, wait, he went bad after all. It's not... doesn't work. Um, otherwise, production value being excellent. Um, I do have a problem with the score by Harry Gregson Williams. Um, Alien and the other films, they did a good job of having scores be... their, their music be something which fit with the tone. Even with Alien 3, um, the score for that all gave a sense of that things are going to go badly. Um, 
and the things are gonna be unpleasant. They they sell the men they sell the menace and the dread when things are when things go bad they sell the menace and dread. The only times when they really don't, as far as like when they try to get sort of heroic or anything, is when in heroic moments, um, like when the Nostromo takes off from LV426 in the first film, we get a sort of heroic theme going. Like, okay, good, we're out of we're, they're out of this part, we're safe, and hopefully the audience doesn't remember, oh, right, we're halfway through the movie, there's still the, the other half of the movie to go, we're not out of the woods yet. But some of that, um, other problems, I mean, the other thing that just, it keeps basically going to, going to the back of the heroic theme too much in places where it doesn't fit. When things start going bad, the heroic theme should not come up until the threat has been completely overcome. That doesn't happen here. Uh, I'm not, I'm fine with cognitive distance in my music in my movie scores. I enjoyed the anime film Ozama Tezuka's Metropolis, which is directed by Rintaro, and I enjoyed that. And it had a very score which. which kind of broke with the tone at times, very jazzy score when there was even when there's some heavy stuff going on, particularly at the film's conclusion. Here, we don't get that sense of cognitive dissonance, which is, again, unfortunate. Um, so now I'm going to get really into this more, I have to get into spoilers. Um, I'm going to count to three, and then say now. Once I say now, we have entered spoiler territory. So before I get into the this, I just want to say, this is a film where I think the Kingdom of Heaven thing is going on. Where the theatrical cut is going to be inferior to what the director originally had in mind. And while the director will endorse this cut publicly, at least early on, we will probably later see a special edition director's cut come out later, which will be superior to the original. I would recommend rating for that before going to see this, either if you get a theatrical release of that director's cut or the DVD Blu-ray release. Wait for that. Hold off on seeing this in the theater. Alright, with that said, countdown to spoilers. Three, two, one, spoilers. So this film fails as it being a prequel to Alien. Alien set on the planet LV426, and the system, star system, is aided too reticuli. Um, we have dip. Um, I mean, basically, this film is set in the same universe as Alien, but it fails to be a prequel. The film set on a different planet. It's set on LV223, I think. Um, there's the space jockey aliens, which we now are not, which are now being referred to as the engineers, are present. But they're not carrying, at least at this installation or wherever, they're not carrying the facehugger uh, face hugger eggs. Um, we see a prototypical chest, bur um, chest burster sort of thing, but it's not quite the same thing. As far as the, it's not the same design. Um, and here's the big thing: in Alien. The company knew about the signal from this planet. They knew they knew about the warning beacon. They knew that there was something there. There was a big possibility they knew about the face. They knew about the um, the our engineers slash space jockeys, which is why they sent the ship. Which is why they diverted the Nostromo. The problem is here, as written in this film. The only person who gives a damn about fighting the aliens is Wayland. Um, and he dies at the end of the film. Everyone dies at the end of the film except for, one except for the character of Dr. Shaw. Dr. Shaw does not send a report back to Earth saying, Oh, here's what happened to this expedition. Don't send anyone here. Instead, she sends a message, a message saying, Basically, Ripley's sign-off transmission from Alien saying this planet is death, stay away. No specific reason why she says this planet is death, just 
it's death, it's bad, stay away from it. It could mean, oh, there's terrible tectonic activity here. It could mean that this planet gets fried by solar flares every few days, so the exp and this caused the expedition to be wiped out. Nothing like that. It just just says, oh, this planet is death. Um, and there's not really enough reason to send another expedition. So as far as the Wayland company, Wayland company is concerned, this mission has failed horribly, and we should, and this line of inquiry should be avoided entirely. Unless you want to take the route that in the merger with Utani, we got evil corporate influences involved because Japanese companies are evil. In which case, as I stated in my review of Black Blade, screw that. <clears throat> That's basically falling into the '80s. Uh, anti-Japan racism trap. And I don't want to do that. Um, yeah, so as, as far as the concern with the Alien franchise, there's no reason for this, for there to be any follow-ups to this expedition. At all. Ever. You know, this is in the Alien, clearly, in the Alien universe. This is clearly a prequel to Alien. And any, and even if Ripley says, oh, it's only a spiritual prequel, it's still BS. I mean, like, the Wayland logo, logo is all over everything. It's basically the Wayland Yutani logo, except without the little combination WY. This is the. I mean. The synthetics. I like the synthetics from Alien. And in particular, what, what kind of makes this the most galling, as someone who pays attention to film scores, because I listen to the score on All Classical 899. When we meet. See, Professor Wayland, when he gives his this holographic briefing early on in the film, the score kicks into the theme from Alien composed by Jerry Goldsmith. I'll say it again, it uses the theme from Alien. Not like a brief reference, let me ignore it. No, it's put in the credits, theme from Alien composed by Jerry Goldsmith. It's blah, 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 all the other crap. It's one thing to go, okay, it's a spiritual sequel, it doesn't, spiritual prequel, it's not going to directly tie into anything too much. But if you're going to do that, don't put the alien theme in it. Leave it out. Just stick with your own musical score, musical theme. I mean, put your little shout outs with the Wayland Corporation and that sort of stuff. But stick with your own cues. Let just trust your composer and let him do what he wants to. Let him do his own thing. But once you I mean like if I'm making a James Bond movie, or if I'm doing like a spiritual prequel to James Bond about someone else in MI6, if I put in the da 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 or any other part of the Bond theme, you are immediately drawing the James Bond connection. If I'm making a spiritual prequel to the Star Trek films, if I start putting cues of, Alex, of references to Alexander Courage or Jerry Goldsmith's Star Trek themes, or even the James Horner theme from um, Star Trek 2 and 3, as the audience, you should be drawing the mental connection, mental direct connection to Star Trek, not just a spiritual connection or of common DNA. Music is a powerful thing. Don't underestimate it. Um, so that, that that's a big thing there. It, it's it seemed like a little always a little nitpick thing, but I mean, this is the, music is the part of the film which is composed in post after the entire film has been assembled, a final cut has been put together and been sent to the composer to watch, compose music while watching, and then direct and conduct a orchestra in performing. So by this point, you have you as the director know what your final product is going to be. So do it. Stick with the final product. Um. So, other bits that bug me about this little thing, um, about this film. Honestly, I feel like the like what I mentioned earlier before the, the spoiler cut, that this is a film which feels like there's going to be a director's cut of it later, along the lines of Kingdom of Heaven. 
That's because there are lots of bits here which are appear to be clearly missing. Like, we should be getting more character development for these characters, but there aren't. Like, there were scenes of character development there that were written and possibly shot to develop these characters further, but were then cut because of time, because the studio said, oh, we feel like th this movie needs to be shorter, or whatever. Sort of like what happened with the Kingdom of Heaven, and the original cut was three hours, 25 minutes, and the studio made him cut him cut it down by like an hour, hour and a half, something like that, um, and all sorts of other stuff. There is a Chekhov gun, Chekhov's gun that is set up in this one chamber in the film. This is the, the film with the vases, vases which are set up like the alien eggs, and which has the f face sculpture. From um, that we see in movie posters and that sort of thing. I, I do apologize for the visual glitches, by the way. Yeah, I need to get a real camera at some point. Anyway, I'm digressing. It has the uh, face in it and that we see in all the movie posters and the trailers and stuff. Behind that, we see this sculpture, clearly done by H.R. Giger. Giger is very much involved in this, with not just in terms of like elements from original Alien, like the. Uh, space jockey and the space jockey's chair and that sort of thing. There are plenty of other elements here which say this, like H.R. Giger was involved in this this particular film production of this. Um, now the sculpture here, and in front of it is this sort of crystalline device which nobody investigates. It's like this Chekhov's gun thing here, where they can feel pain, which I feel like there should have been a payoff, but we didn't get it. And I'm not sure what that would be. It may as well be a case like with the Avengers, where we get the fake Chekhov's gun of Thor zapping Tony Stark with the um, lightning, and that powering up the uh, armor. It'd be a fake Chekhov's gun like that, but I feel like there's something missing there. Um, there's a payoff that's supposed to be there, but we didn't get. Um... Charlize Theron, I will say one thing, different thing about her character. Charlize Theron is probably the closest you get to a Ripley as antagonistic character in a film like this. Because she is the one who is pro character who is probably the most genre savvy from in there. She is crazy prepared. Um, and she is the one who generally acts the way, the most logical way that you probably could in the, under these circumstances, more or less. Um, but, I mean, she dies. I mean, she, I mean, she's an antagonistic character, so I can I understand why they kill her off. And But, it is kind of interesting taking that route here. Um, and that, that was probably one of the few good bits that I, got, that I liked that I couldn't say in front of the spoiler block. Um, other than that, though, this film had problems. This film had real problems. And I feel like a lot of them were due to omission. The, um, the scenes that were cut, that were, that were probably shot and filmed and possibly even scored, um... The character development that was lost, all sorts of other stuff, and I feel like a director's cut would fix a lot of these move this movie's problems. I don't know if we'll get it. I hope we do, but I feel like that would make this a bet. A director's cut would make this a better film. Mostly, there's still other problems here. Doctor Shaw and her boyfriend husband act in an incredibly unscientific fashion. Um, and I'm not expecting Saul scientists to be atheists or agnostics, but I am expecting scientists to recognize that extraordinary claims require extraordinary proof, and when it comes to giant scientific expeditions out in the middle of nowhere, that they have a more reasonable th hypothesis for what they're, pl what they're going to find than, oh, we were designed and seeded by precursor, pre by precursor aliens, because that's what I want to believe. Not because I have evidence to back that up when they don't, when all they have is evidence that they were visited. Um, 
And that's pretty much it. Again, I would wait for a DVD release or Blu-ray release for a special edition if you're going special director's edition if you're going to buy it. Otherwise, if you're going to go if you just want to see the theatrical cut, I'd wait and rent it either from a DVD or Blu-ray or off of Amazon Instant Video or something. Um, before I sign off with this, I do want to talk about the trailers I saw. Uh, most of them were not very good. We had a sort of comedy science fiction film involving um, Ben Stiller and Vince Vaughn and a bunch of other people who are on a neighborhood watch who discover there are aliens in their neighborhood or aliens invading it in their neighborhood. It's like suburban attack the block. Could be funny, I guess. Maybe. I don't know. Um, probably not. And there was um, the house at the end of the street or house at the left end of the street or something like that. Like, yeah, house at the end of the street because the acronym for the title is HATES. Which looks like it's going to be your last house on the left style urban, suburban, torture porn film thing. Skip it, I'm not going to go see it. Sam Raimi has what it looks like I describe as... Actually, I saw this movie with a bunch of friends, and one of them described this as Jewish The Exorcist. Or The Jewish Exorcist or whatever. Um, could be interesting, I guess. It's not directed by Sam Raimi, it's produced by him. But it still could turn out okay. Um, I kind of like a, a the sort of if you do a exorcist style horror film properly, I could see it being done interestingly. Um, as far as like if you're not go don't go the found footage route, don't go the based on a true story route. Just try to just, we're gonna do a demonic possession exorcism thing. Just make it a movie movie and play up the demonic power. And that's some of, the, some of the better... I think some of the better Hammer films were the ones which go overtly supernatural, either with like the Frankenstein supernatural super science route, the Dracula route, or the um, satanic cult horror route. Um, I mean... Yeah. I mean, this, this is going to be... I mean, this is more flashy than the Hammer stuff, but... There's a bigger budget than the Hammer stuff. So, anyway, I'm kind of going to, looking forward to watching it, probably at the comfort of my own home, since I don't want watching horror movies in the theater, how well that works. Um, other than that, on the action movie front, we have Gangster Squad, which is a, um, basically, it's, it's like West Coast Untouchables, where it's um, a group of the LAPD from the 1920s, basically told, alright, you are going we are, you are making you deniable assets or whatever just go out and take out Mickey Doyle the gangster who is basically trying to take over Los Angeles uh, it could be interesting, I'm a sucker for cops and robbers and Tommy Guns movies um I mean, this, I mean, there's enough going there's not enough scenes in this trailer of people going full auto with Tommy Guns like, out, off the sides of cars, and, like, just walking forward, blazing with the Tommy gun from the hip. I'm going, okay, I'm in. You, you sold me. You you had me at Tommy gun. Um, and the trailer for, Dejan for Django Unchained. The D is silent, as the movie lets you know. Uh, to the latest film from Quentin Tarantino. This is his... This is Spaghetti Western movie. He's done... Black exploitation. He's done martial arts. He's done heist. He's done um, nonlinear narrative. Well, he's done nonlinear narrative for all of them. So, oh, and he's done 1960s World War II film. Why not? Looks fun. So, that's my thoughts on Prometheus. Wait for the wait for the director's cut. And I look for, and I will see you all later. Bye.